So I'll start by quickly introducing myself. I'm Erica Trump, and my academic background is in chemical engineering. I've always been interested in teaching and had a passion for student education, and I now have the really fun job of leading our student engagement program at OSIsoft. And uh, part of what we do is we provide software and training materials for student learning and classroom activities, and also for uh, capstone and real world data projects. So we do this in part to give back to our customers because we realize that industry innovation is very closely linked with engineering education. First, uh, industry innovation has really changed the skill set that is needed for engineers and for operators. Skills in data visualization and analytics are now foundational skills. Uh, also, we need to be generating the next innovators. So challenging students with open-ended design projects that will uh, teach them how to synthesize new ideas by considering engineering principles and by looking at uh, real-world data it is very important. So OSIsoft provides the digital infrastructure that helps you to connect students to data. Uh, the data can come from sources on campus, like from university operations, or it may come from research that's conducted on campus. Also, it could come from external partners, like maybe another academic institution, or, or perhaps from industry in sharing a data set. So that's all I have. And now the panelists will briefly introduce themselves. Yeah, so I'm Pratt Rogers. I'm currently at University of Utah. I'm fairly new. I started there a few years ago. Um, and my background's in mine in engineering. You can go to the, kind of the next slide. And there's a picture of our campus there in the, the beautiful Wasatch Mountains in the background. Uh, originally, I'm from Arizona, from University of Arizona. Um, all my degrees have been, have been in mine in engineering. Uh, I worked at a technology startup while I was doing my PhD uh, we, at, called Mysum Technologies. Uh, we helped mining companies you know, with various mining, usually, usually developed mining analytics for, for these companies. Uh, we had a, you know, a large team of um, data warehouse programmers. Or, and we also were a, a partner with, we had a partnership with uh, OSI. Um, and I think, um, you know, as, as I have seen some pictures here. It's an interesting thing about, um, you know, at, at being in, I'm really passionate about how we, you know, create this new generation of mining engineers that are, you know, have the appropriate level of, of digital experience and expertise. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to see what's that appropriate level, um, how well, how, how much degree of programming do we need to expose these engineers to. Um, and, yeah, that's kind of, that's, that's all for me, I okay. guess. George? Hi, I'm George Patterson from the University of Iowa. I manage the Energy Control Center there. Um, <clears throat> I've got four slides. I'm going to ask you to do two things at once, if you can. And if you can't, just ignore my talking, OK? I wanted to share some slides out of our, one of our student projects that did use PI data. And you can just read those while I'm introducing myself. Um, anybody know where Iowa is? <laughs> OK. Uh, the SESME uh, presentation had a map, and you saw that big empty area in the middle of the U.S. where you fly from the East Coast to the West Coast. We're just kind of in the middle of that, about uh, 230 miles west of Chicago. Um, so I was hired 22 years ago at the power plant for the university, uh, part of the utility enterprise, and one of my tasks at the time was to <clears throat> balance the energy and mass of the ins and outs of the plant every month. And that was a super important report because that determined all our revenue, okay? Um, at the time, the data came from, no, not pie, it came from operators wandering around the plant with sheets on clipboards, and they took data when they weren't, I mean, when, when they didn't have emergencies. And uh, so there were lots of gaps in the data, there were lots of inaccuracies, it wasn't very reliable, made doing the report very tough. And as a computer science student at the time, I said, I know there's got to be an easier way. So I started interfacing with the control system through Excel, 
you know, automated some of the reporting and the data, but then, you know, we came across Pi about 14 years ago, and it's been an absolute game changer, lifesaver for the utility. Um, we have, you know, a power plant which provides steam to the entire campus and the hospital complex. We have three chilled water plants, uh, a water plant, electrical distribution, steam distribution, water distribution, sewer. All of this stuff is highly automated and we pull in all that data from those systems into Pi. We also have steam, electric, and chill water meters on all of the 90 buildings that are on our central system on campus um, and all that data goes into Pi and uh, it, it's very dense data. Um, we also have multiple building control systems on campus which are a key part of our energy management program and we selectively bring data from those systems into Pi. Um, all told, uh, our enterprise is a $90 million a year enterprise. About a third of that goes to direct energy purchases which are things like coal, biomass, natural gas, and electricity. We generate electricity uh, for part of our load but we purchase a large portion of it from our, our local supplier. Um, and the Energy Control Center came about about seven years ago. I was asked to lead a team to create an Energy Control Center and, you know, a uh, boss came up to me and said, would you lead this team? I was like, sure, and not thinking, not knowing what it was they wanted me to do really. So I said, what is it? And the answer was, well, we don't really know, but we want you to create this thing. Let us know when you've got it. So we went away with a team of people and what we've, what we've determined is we had a massive amount of data about all the energy systems on our campus, all the hundreds of thousands of building control points, the thousands of points from our plants and our distribution and our building metering. We wanted to leverage that data, get value out of it. And, and so that's really what the Energy Control Center is all about. We create visualizations, um, we create benchmarks, various reports, analyses, and I, I liken ourselves not too much so much as a control center but more like a data library and we're kind of the librarians who help people get access to the data they need and interpret it. Thank you. Steve. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Steve Moore. Uh, I grew up in, uh, grew up and lived in Corpus Christi, Texas, one of the uh, hotbeds of the uh, oil and gas industry boom that we're having right now uh, in the United States. Um, and my job is to teach process operators. Um, it's, I, I work at uh, Del Mar College and I am the instructor and the director of our process technology program there. Um, before coming to Del Mar, I spent about 25 years in one of the local refineries um, and about 20 of those years sitting on a console, uh, which is a, a, a console or a board operator. Um, there was no tool that I used more at my job than Pi. Um, and we just didn't use it for troubleshooting. We used it to make sure why we validated. Why, why is this tower running good? Why are we ha making good products right now? So when I became par uh, a partner with Del Mar um, to train our process operators coming out of school, um, one of the things that we were missing uh, was one of the key key things we were missing was this way to tie in what we were teaching in class and this one tool that we did not have Pi. And that's when I reached out to Pi and you guys so graciously helped us with that. So my name is Leo uh, Moreira. I'm, I'm an oil and gas manager at Radix. Uh, um, my background is, my, my background is uh, automation engineering automation and controls engineering. Uh, currently, uh, I think the reason I'm here in this panel is because we are implementing uh, an energy control center in the University of Massachusetts. So it's something very close to what George just described. And uh, the idea there is to, uh, they have a challenge of operating the, the central heating plant, which produces steam and electricity for the campus. And, and, and their challenge is to uh, uh, manage uh, this, uh, all these uh, uh, pieces of equipment and, be, and, and make sure that they turn on what needs to be turned on and turned off when, uh, in, in an efficient way, an effective and efficient way. 
So uh, uh, this project uh, that we are doing now uh, at this uh, at this moment is is, is going is ongoing. Uh, uh, during that project, we hired two interns from the University of Massachusetts, which uh, was a very big, uh, very uh, good uh, uh, hire. We were also thinking of hiring them uh, to the company after they, they finished the internship. Uh, uh, we for for hiring for the process of hiring we, we did a hackathon in the, in the university and we uh, with the Pi system uh, for them to make some dashboards and and we give them a, a, a big challenge of, of of for them to produce some dashboards and the results were were impressive so yes so that's it. great thank you. So I have a question for really all of the panelists here, but maybe uh, Steve, you could start out. So uh, what is your motivation for challenging students with real world industrial data sets? Um, after, after one of the things that we do um, in, in our department is we reach out to our advisory committees and our advisory committees um, let us know um, what they're seeing, um, what I've seen, um, is that our, the quality of our operators um, from past to present has fallen off pretty dramatically. Okay. And so what we needed to do to address that is to actually start teaching process, teaching thermodynamics, teaching gas laws, the things that we can teach in class but the, so like I said earlier, the, the one tool that I did not have for them to use to actually go out and, and see this data is Pi. And so without going out and retrieving this data and actually looking at basically what came first, the chicken or the egg, uh, and sometimes it, it, it's something as simple as that that can save a unit, that they did not have this skill. Um, and so, um, <coughs> This is a big part of our program is to show them not only to how to how to go and retrieve this data, but how to analyze this data and validate uh, why you're doing good things, validate what see what happened in an emergency situation where we um, where we could have done things a little bit differently. Sure. And without without doing something like that, you're you're pretty much condemned to repeat it. And so mm -hmm. uh, it's a huge part of uh, our, our, our program. Yeah, um, Pratt, do you have any comments about what educational outcomes you achieve with that? You know, I think one of the main educational outcomes, at least from a mining engineering perspective, is I think the industry is demanding that we have, I think, uh, you know, data or technology translators uh, that can connect to what's the capability of some sort of technological system or analytical learning, whatever the new buzzwords are, to some sort of operational and engineering standard. and. Uh, that would be one of the outcomes I'd like to see that the engineers that come through some of my courses or, or programs is that they can provide that role of translate what's possible and also manage teams to be able to execute on that. And um, bringing in real world data really helps uh, uh, make that, those connections. So. Okay. Uh, George, I'd like to hear your perspective a bit and also if you could talk about the projects you've done with students and what kind of outcomes. Okay. For you, Kama. Um, so from my perspective, we've got over 14 years worth of essentially real-time data on all of our energy and production systems uh, across our campus. And, and I see that as a huge university asset. Okay, we've, we've spent time and money uh, licensing, et cetera, to build up that asset, and we use it for facilities management. But why can't we share that with the academic side of the house since our core mission at heart is to educate people. That's what the university is there for. So I feel really strongly that this data should be shared with the students. Um, and so we, we've made attempts to do that. We have a, an energy systems design class, which is a, a capstone class for seniors. And for the last three years, they have used our data to analyze different kinds of therm thermodynamic problems. Um, one of the things they analyzed in 2015 was uh, limitations on our chilled water storage system and why we weren't you know, getting the return out of that system that we wanted to. And so they did the analysis, and I think if you read any of those slides I had up, you probably got the, 
the, the gist of it, but the idea is that we were limited by tower capacity. And so in fact, we are building another tower right now that'll be operational for this cooling season. And so the work that the students did has actually come full circle and had an impact on our facilities operations. So Leo, any comments? Yes, I think it, I think one one important thing is that to put to give the op the opportunity for the students to 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 have some contact with this uh, with these uh, industrial tools, right? Because when you come out of when you go out of college, when you when you just graduate, you don't necessarily have a lot of experience with these tools that are available in the market that you have to use. So I think this one, this, this is, is very important as mm -hmm. an ed educational uh, thing. So, uh, for example, these interns that are working with us, they, they, were, they, have, uh, they have now experience with the Pi system, which, okay. which can be very, very good for the, for the future, the professional future, right? So, uh, George, why, why do you think it's important for students to be using a real data set? Why not just simulate something for the students? Um, so, decades ago when I was in school, we didn't have all this data, right? I mean, we had textbooks and professors who gave you, a, you know, maybe, an, well, we didn't have Excel, so they gave you <laughs> some data on a piece of paper and said, here, go analyze it. And, and the professor knew the answer, and you knew they knew the answer, and quite frankly, I'm not sure we cared that much about the answer other than we had to get a grade, right? So I think one of the important things is that um, working with real data and real problems, which, you know, engineers are here to solve problems, right? And, and I think it motivates them greatly to solve a real problem that maybe hasn't even been solved before. So I think that's a really important mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, aspect of it, is the motivational piece. But the other piece is that you know, when you work with real data from real plants, um, it's not the same as working with a clean data set, right? Um, it, it's an eye-opener for students to realize that, you know, this sensor may have gotten uh, interrupted in its communications for three days or something, or you may have three temperature sensors that theoretically all reflect the same thing and none of them agree. So how do you choose which one to use? So these are real world aspects of working with data that they only get if they work with real data. And so I think that's extremely important and it, it better prepares the students to go out and uh, solve real problems in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll join. <laughs> so um, Pratt or Steve, do you have any comments? I, I do, uh, sorry. Um, we actually have a, we, we have a pilot plant. We have, and I forgot to mention that earlier. I'm a little nervous. Anyway, so we, um, we actually have a glycol distillation unit, and we have a little, uh, little hot skid trainer that we, that we have our, our students on. Um, well, one of the things you can't let students do is, is play, with, play with flammables. Um, bad <laughs> things happen. So, so they'll never, and, and while they're at school with me, if I don't get some real-time data from people, I'm never going to get to show them a heater trip. I'm never going to get to show them a boiler trip and how things, how things domino and affect either before or after. Um, and so, and a local refinery, any of our, you pick any one of our local refineries and they're going to get more data in one day than I'm going to get in a year. And just like I said, if you, the more we can show our students and get them educated before they get in the workforce is less that our, 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 our facilities have to train and it gives them a better understanding of it, the thing that I try to teach, which is process or AKA cause and effect. And so without real data, um, it, it makes our job just that much harder. Yeah, you know, I, right now I'm teaching a class, just a general data management class for a mining or industrial engineer or chemical engineer. And one of the simplest things that we had tried to do is, okay, ideally this is how you calculate availability and utilization of, a, of an asset. And that's different between, between a fixed asset or a mobile asset that we have in mining. Um, but fundamentally the principles of calculating availability and utilization are the same. Uh, but you know, so I teach the ideal way and then I show them a real data set and I just go calculate availability and utilization. And, um, and they begin to realize that things aren't coded properly in the data. Uh, they begin to realize that there's subtle differences between a fixed equipment or a mobile equipment. And so therefore, how do we compare these assets one against another? Uh, and, 
and they'd come up to me, Professor, how come these how come these hours are adding up to 24? There's only 24 hours in a day. How come I see for this asset it has 33 and this asset only has 18 accounted for? And it's like, yeah, welcome to real data and uh, welcome to real life. Uh, so you can have an idealistic way of doing things, but then you have to expose them gently to the real world and uh, some level of realism. Uh, and tools like OSI and, and, and the Pi infrastructure really help facilitate that process. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's all I got. I have a comment uh, adding to your, to your uh, uh, statement is that um, when, you, when you are in college or in, in the university, uh, you, you tend to analyze the trends as a, you know, as a continuous, really uh, smooth uh, line. And then when you, uh, this is another thing that's really important. When, you t when you're dealing with actual uh, real-time data, you see like more like a, uh, very, uh, very several variations, and then you have to sometimes use uh, uh, subjects of of a class that you didn't mind so much, or statistic uh, statistics, or anything that's not. So, I have to apply what I learned in the in this uh, in this course that I didn't give much uh, importance as as I should have. So uh, the opportunity to see at real-time data brings that to the to the table as, uh, as well. So you ha you have to consider uh, these other disciplines that you might have ignored or or just uh, did uh, what what you have what you what you did to pass or anything. So maybe that's a good uh, uh, thing as well. Yeah. So I I'm convinced. Are, are you guys? <laughs> so. Uh, what advice would you give to other instructors or um, others who are looking to start these projects at their at their universities? Who are looking to engage with industry, get a data set. Everyone take a stand. I have a diverse set of companies you're working with. Um, and I say that you know, I've worked with large money companies, um, some of the, the biggest world uh, biggest companies and uh, I've worked working in them almost two years, and I'm still trying to get an NDA through there. Uh, I have people on site convinced that this is a great idea, let's do it, um, but we run into NDA problems. Uh, and so I also have smaller to mid-sized companies that are more nimble, uh, but don't have R&D budgets, but they're willing to share data. And so uh, I you know, have a portfolio of about five or six companies that I'm trying to work with of, of getting both relational type of data and signal-based data that come from a, from a plant. And uh, both have different strategies for both. The smaller companies, I want data because I think I can get through the lawyers quite, uh, quite easier, but they don't have R&D budgets. So the bigger companies, I'm working kind of have a strategy trying to get the NDAs figured out and then pitching projects because um, they have R&D budgets. And so, because um, it's a combination of both. You gotta help the students, but if I don't get research, I can't help the students because I'm not gonna be around anymore. And so uh, it's a kind of a interesting, Dynamic. So having a, a portfolio of companies is, is really helpful. I would say reach out to your re, reach out to your prospective facilities uh, through your advisory committees and and start having the discussion of of, of this transfer of, of real world data to uh, or sharing this of sharing this data and 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 he's, uh, George alluded to there there are some stumbling blocks and there are some things that are going to get in the way but it's important and um, and it'll only benefit us and our in our in our workforce in the future. Um, real simply put, if you don't have a Pi system, get a Pi system because then you can <laughs> then you can capture a lot of data from your own systems, your own labs, your own experiments, your building, whatever, that is relevant to your students on site. Because I think relevancy is extremely important. Um, I have an addendum to one of the other answers I gave. I just I forgot to mention, but I think one of the big benefits students get out of this is learning to collaborate. Because you know we're no longer in the time period when one individual can take one project and complete it on their own from start to finish. That just doesn't happen anymore. Now it's you know multiple disciplines working together. When they work with our data on these projects, they're forced to work with people like me, with our energy engineers, with our plant engineers, with operators. They have to work with all these dis different disciplines to investigate the source of the information they're seeking and learn to communicate, which that is 
you know, the single biggest problem I think all engineers, everybody working faces, not just all engineers, is clearly communicating. And, and I think they, they get some uh, lessons in communication on this. Thank you. Yes, so we do have time for a couple questions from the audience, if anyone would. Um, so, and this may have been covered, but my name is Rash Honda from OSI Soft. What are some of the challenges in the skill sets or approaches of the students that you see that kind of make a mindset that you need to understand or look, you know, overcome? At, overcome is probably the wrong word, but just kind of the mindset. What do you see is kind of the biggest benefit and the biggest roadblock? Or are there none? Okay. So, uh, regarding the, the, the mindset, I think. Uh, students uh, they come out of, of the university um, trying to address uh, in one only in one way the problems right so when you when you when you understand that the problem is actually a, a, an onion right so you have to unpeel maybe the root cause belongs to your uh, discipline but you have to unpeel the onion and maybe to while unpeeling that that you you're going to see that any that this layer belongs to another discipline or this layer belongs to another so I think that's the, the I think that's the main uh, the main thing that they, that that they need to understand or that we need to to make them understand so that's the the biggest challenge I think sometimes the students want a clear question and a clear answer uh, and I think in the real world there's no such thing as a as a clear question or a, you don't really get a clear answer uh, but the process of going and trying to answer the question is you know one of the things that uh, I look for uh, and a willingness to ask Google the right question is something that uh, I think is fundamental to a successful engineer um, it may be I may get ostracized by some of the old school professors but um, you know, be, being able to quickly ans find, ans ask the right question on, on Google, dig into the right threads to overcome a s certain problem, I think is, is really important. And sometimes, um, in one of these classes in particular, I, I'm very vague, uh, and uh, usually I try to, usually because I'm busy, I don't like giving them all the details in the, in the question, but it also helps them, you know, know how to operate in an environment where you have a a manager is not going to give you everything clear, uh, and it's uh, they get really upset with that. But by the end of it, I think they um, uh, well, the successful ones have been able to know how to navigate that. The other ones are they're going to be delegated to a corner engineer at some point where they'll be able to work on by themselves. But either way, it's an interest. It's a different mindset. So we have time for one more comment. So George. Uh a quick question for you. One of the big uh, concerns that we often hear in the marketplace is um, I'm, I'm part of an organization that's here to keep the lights on for the campus um, and I have some concerns about sharing my data with the students. Can you comment about how Iowa has addressed that? We like to think of ourselves as being transparent and we will share our data widely and we do so. Um, the risk that comes with that is that um, data has to have context, right? And sometimes the data goes out, but the context doesn't. So the, the consumer of the data may make assumptions about what that data really represents and come up with false answers. So, you know, one of the things we do is say, take all the data you want, do what you want with it, but if you're going to publish, come back to us and make sure that we review it so that we understand that you understood, you know, what the data was really about. So thank you. I, I don't think we have time for more questions, but we'll all be around. So thanks. <laughs>